Hello, ASMR people. Jason, back here again. Today is going to be a little bit of a simple video. I'm going to show off my some of my collection of baseball cards. I um, have collected them for a while and I was a dealer on eBay for a bit so I uh, still have a decent amount and not, not really actively collecting new stuff very much but I do have some decent stuff so I thought I'd show them off plus give you a little bit of tapping along the way I'm going to start with my most valuable card. It would be the 1954 Topps Hail K line. It is in excellent condition, worth, I don't know, somewhere between $200 and $250 maybe. top set was a very good one it had a lot of rookie cards in it it has Hank Aaron's rookie card and Ernie Banks rookie card Bowman had locked down a lot of the major stars in 1954 including Mickey Mantle and Willie Mays So Tops had to uh, include some younger, lesser known players in their set. So what happened was they got some rookies probably a year before they normally would have put them in a set. So it's a nice set. It's also a little smaller if someone's trying to build a set, which I think can be a good thing. Let's move on to the next card. The next card you might not even classify as a card at all. It is a 1935 Diamond Matchbook. Howie Marins. During the Depression, Many uh, kids collected matchbooks. There wasn't a lot of money, and you can buy them pretty cheap, even use the matches in them. So, there's a lot of matchbooks out there, not just sports, but other things. Well, the sports ones are pretty valuable. You may be able to see this is graded a PSA 2. In my humble opinion, PSA does not grade matchbooks correctly. The matchbook, of course, has a crease where the, the flap pulled it over. So um, PSA considers that to be a crease in the card, which if it came new that way, then obviously it's not. But in any case, it does authenticate it. Match people who collect matchbooks only collect ones that have a, the striker in it, so you can see the striker up here. The uh, diamond matchbook 
folks um, in the mid 30s had a baseball and football set as well. They had uh, actors and actresses, radio personalities, a lot of different things. I value this card at somewhere around $100. To continue on with our pre-war theme, I've got some 1936 Diamond Stars. Tom Bridges and Jojo White. Neither card is in very good condition. Maybe good. So we're looking at a 2, 2.5 maybe. value these at about $15-$20 a piece. Next card I have is 1952 Bowman, Gil Hodges. The Brooklyn Dodgers, that is 1957 and before Dodger cards, tend to have a little bit of a premium compared to other team associations. Um, a lot of kids collected baseball cards from the area of Brooklyn back then, so they're such a like team too. They're a very good team also, by the way. Had a lot of stars. This card had grade VG to excellent. I'd put a value maybe around $25 on it. Maybe $30. Next card is a 1962 post, Mickey Mantle. The, um, these cards came on the back of boxes of cereal. You would cut them out and there would be the card. And they made them for a couple, three years. They're quite a large set. If you try to complete the set, there are 200 different ones. Um, some of the cards that were on less popular brands of cereal are considered short printed. There were a few other ways of getting these though, however, and this one is an exception. It was not on the back of a box cereal. It was in a magazine. You can tell by 
has the writing on the back. Uh, the magazine cut ones carry a little bit of a premium compared to the post serial. Fortunately, this one has writing on the back, which increases the value. Really hard to gauge the value of this because of that. But I would still think it's probably worth maybe 40 bucks. Next card is a 1963 Pride of the National League featuring Willie Mays and Stan Musial. It is grade 6, excellent mint. I'd value it at maybe thirty to forty dollars. Um, sometimes these cards with two major stars on them are popular, although they tend to be valued less than the player's individual card. Um, they kind of have high demand because get two stars instead of one. They're a good way to get, for example, a Stan Musial card or Willie Mays. Uh, you know, you, you don't have the $200 to buy a regular card, but you can afford this one that has two both players on it. Some of the more popular multiplayer cards are ones when they have multiple players of the players from the same team. One that comes to mind is the 1957 Tops uh, that has Mantle, Barra, and, and Bauer on it. Next card I have is the 1960 Master and Mentor. Um, it has Willie Mays and his manager Rigney. Card's not that great of condition, probably VG to excellent. Probably still worth twenty to twenty five dollars. Again, it's an affordable way to get into a nineteen sixty Willie Mays. one of the few 
1960 tops cards that are portrait and not landscape. to continue on the Willie Mays thing I've been doing here recently. We have an interesting card. This is a 1968 Topps game card. They were uh, extra insert and inserted into some 1968 Topps packs. Uh, the idea was you could um, collect several and uh, play a sort of a playing cards version of baseball. For instance, uh, if you drew this card, you get a home run. This card is probably worth maybe $20. Uh, they are worth a little bit less because it's easier to find in good condition since they don't have corners to see how they're rounded. Of course, they do have a lot of them have like this bad centering on the back. Some 68 packs, you know, came with no inserts, and I think some came with different insert, but some of them came with these, and it wasn't a random pack thing. I believe the box would tell you if it came with these playing cards. Next card is a 1967 Cards Clubbers. It has Lou Brock and Kurt Flood. I would say some VG to excellent, probably only worth $10, $15 in this condition. Kurt Flood is an interesting character. He is the one who challenged the reserve clause in baseball, essentially making him sit out pretty much the whole end of his career. The lawsuit lasted several years, and Kurt Flood actually lost, but that lawsuit brought about free agency in baseball. Essentially, before the, uh, that lawsuit, even when your contract was up, you couldn't go to another team to get a new contract. That team pretty much owned you. The only way you get out is if it was a trade. After this, though, um, once the contract was up, you could go elsewhere. Last card we're going to look at is 1973 Pete Rose. Probably in excellent mint condition. Might be worth 
thirty dollars. P. Rose an interesting character for sure. Um, the debate still rages whether he deserves to be in the Hall of Fame. Nineteen seventy three was last year tops released their uh, cards in series um, pretty much in series means they would release packs with um, let's say cards 1 through 400 then the um, next series would have uh, 401 through 550 and then the final series would have 550 through 650 or 700 whatever wasn't exactly like that uh, in the 50s that you yeah, that's how it would be for sure and then by the 70s uh, the higher series would also include some of the lower series cards but 1974 and on the packs they released were, um, had all the cards pretty much. The high series were usually worth the most because it was getting late in the year and there was less interest in baseball cards. Higher series often would have uh, less of the newer, younger players, so you can get rookies often in the higher series. It'd be going during the season too, so you know if someone started to have a good season right at the beginning, well, they'd have time to make a card of them. So if you like this content, let me know. I can show off more cards I have. Or if, um, if uh, this video is successful enough, I could I would consider um, buying a, um, a uh, vintage pack, maybe a pack from the 70s, and we'd open it and see what we get. So, um, yeah, let me know. And as always, thank you for watching.